Good morning. I guess I grew overnight. <laughs> Our first reading this morning is from the book of Numbers, verses, chapter, starting with chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, 10 through 16, and 24 through 29. And it can be found on page 140 and 287 in the large print. Now the rebel was among them, had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burdens of this people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep before me and say, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Two men remained in the camp, the one named Aldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all of the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 104. It'll be verses 27 through 35, and we'll read it responsibly. And it can be found on page 596 and page 1,220 of the large print. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning is from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 and can be found on page 1,201 and 2,430 of the large print. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded 
and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years and six months it did not rain. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to uh, St. Mark in the ninth chapter, verses 38 through 50. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us begin with prayer. Good and steadfast God, in your Son we have been given the gift of eternal life and righteousness before you. Empower us to bring the knowledge of your Son to a world hungering and thirsting for mercy and righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Well, about six months ago, um, Pastor asked if I would consider giving the sermon while he was on vacation. And I said, oh, sure. And then uh, all of a sudden, here we are, September 29th. And so I pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we are continuing to walk with Jesus and his disciples as he heads to his destiny in Jerusalem. After Peter had acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus had moved from just performing miracles to teaching his disciples that In the words of Mark 9, verse 31, he, Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and, after three days, rise again. Jesus is focusing on preparing his disciples for what lies ahead, helping them to understand that discipleship is humble service, not position and power. In verse 35, we read, Jesus said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. But darn those disciples, they just weren't getting his message. For in verse 38, we read that John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. It seems our three disciples, Peter, James, and John, tried to stop the exorcist because he wasn't one of the chosen 12. He wasn't following us. John didn't say, wasn't following you, Jesus. The disciples were being prideful. They were relishing their role, their status as uh, part of Jesus' group, and they were trying to exclude the exorcist. And we read about this, a similar thing in the Old Testament lesson with Moses and Eldad and Medad. So if the disciples who were with Jesus suffered from the sin of exclusivity, well, unfortunately, far be it for us, two millennia later, to be free of that same sin of exclusivity. How often do we want all the glory to pat ourselves on the back to build walls up, to protect our turf. Going on in verses 39 and 40, Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. So while the disciples drew a circle to keep out the exorcist, Jesus redrew it to include him. We are all together in this war against evil in our sinful world. And by gosh, we need all the help we can get, which is what Moses said. So our gospel reading today covers several teaching moments such as these. But I'll be focusing mostly on verses 42 through 48. Now, these verses do not contain some of the rosier passages from the Bible. Jesus didn't pull any punches. In particular, they contain some very graphic, perhaps disturbing images. In verse 42, it says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, the Greek word translated to sin is scandalon, kind of think scandalous, which refers to a trap, a snare, or any other impediment that would be placed in in your way and cause you to stumble or fall. So there's an intentionality here, a, a deliberateness on our part to put up barriers to exclude those who live, who believe, who worship, or practice their faith differently from ours. How often have you heard, perhaps said, oh, we don't do it that way, or, well, we've always done it like this. 
Now, as I read this verse, I was reminded of when I was about 10 years old and I was taking swimming lessons at the YMCA. My class was being tested to get into the next level and one of the requirements was to swing, swim four laps of the pool. On my final lap, I was struggling. I was sucking in way, way too much water. As I started to falter and sink, my instructor dove in and rescued me. The millstone that was referred to in our verse isn't just a small human-powered stone. It, it's a large donkey-powered stone that was used to grind grain. A man could not lift it. It possibly weighed several hundred pounds. Placed around your neck and tossed into the sea, the millstone would carry you quickly and directly to the bottom. I think my 10-year-old self identified with that situation. Now, Jesus isn't suggesting we drown people who cause others to stumble. His hyperbole, his exaggerated language, is intended to dramatize the dangers of causing injury to little ones. And that's not necessarily children, but those who are young in their faith, new believers. His point is that if you cause such new believers to stumble, your fate will be more terrible than being suddenly and violently drowned at sea. But Jesus isn't quite finished here. He moves on from talking about causing another person to stumble, an external threat, to the danger of temptations within us, internal threats. Continuing with verses 43 through 48. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life, that is, eternal life, crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Whoa! That's quite a slew of hyperbolic commands about cutting off feet, hands, gouging out eyes. But Jesus was trying to grab the attention of his disciples and shake them loose from their way of thinking. Perhaps he was imagining, what is it going to take to get through their thick skulls? He probably thinks about that about us often. Jesus had just given them his clear-as-a-bell prediction that he was going to suffer and die. And they responded by arguing among them about which one of them was the greatest. I know we would never, ever do anything like that. Perhaps then we can understand Jesus' frustration with his little band of brothers. Of course he didn't want them to literally cut off their body parts. If, if he had, we'd all be hopping around on one foot, we'd be balancing with one arm, and we'd be going in circles because we could only see out of one side of our head. So today we might rephrase Jesus' words, words this way. If it costs an arm and a leg to resist temptation, it's worth it. Now, I'm not suggesting actual amputation either, but I am using similar strong, colorful language to make the point that resisting temptation is very, very important. So while Jesus did not mean for these hyperbolic words to be taken literally, he did want them to be taken seriously. Our foot wants to go its own way, not God's. Our foot can be tireless, working and playing, but has to be dragged into church for one hour. Our hand is eager to serve ourselves, but not others, or pat ourselves on the back. Our eye has 20-20 vision, pointing out the sins of others, but is totally blind to our own. Whether it's bad habits, resentments, 
ambitions, bad relationships, these all pull us into dark places. Why is Jesus so serious about such a little word? Sin. It's a tiny little word that keeps popping up in our gospel text today. Sin. Little word. Sin. Hardly there at all. Sin. Doesn't really matter, does it? Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, it does. Sin has consequences. It doesn't have to be a big sin like murder. Frankly, there aren't big sins and little sins. It doesn't matter that I'm not a chainsaw murdering mama or a dear little old lady who 60 years ago hit her sister. All sin has consequences. It's not always easy to see the consequences, but there's selfishness, greed, bitterness, bullying, resentments, and on and on. They are there. So what if we cut off both hands, both feet, gouge out both eyes? Would that solve the problem? Would that get us to heaven? Getting to heaven requires more than such drastic surgery that only changes our outward appearance. It isn't our hands, our feet, or our eyes that are the problem. It is our sinful nature, our sinful desires, our sinful, human, fallen will that goes all the way back to Adam. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. Unfortunately, as much as we try to not sin, to rid ourselves of shame, guilt, pride, regret, hurt, resentment, whatever, we fail. And our failure, our sin, is what separates us from God. Every week we confess, like we did just briefly ago, we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. No matter how good we think we are, each one of us is guilty of sin. And no amount of effort, good deeds, money, talent, or achievements, nothing, not a zilch, Zero is enough to save us from the millstone around our neck and eternal damnation in hell. But praise the Lord. God really, really, really loves us. He loves us so much that he made a way for us to avoid that millstone, to be rescued from eternity in hell, to be forgiven so that we can spend eternity with God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our rock and salvation. Yes, God wants us to get rid of the sin in our lives, amputate that sin from our lives, lead a godly life. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. So he washes us clean in the healing waters of holy baptism. He feeds us the body and blood of Christ given and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Although Romans 6 verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, it also tells us that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear that? Free gift. We don't have to do one single thing to receive that free gift of salvation. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross as a sacrifice for us and all of our sins. All of them. To pay the debt for our sins. All of them. So we can lay all the sinful thoughts, words, and deeds we've performed with our hands, our feet, and our eyes at Jesus' feet. All the sins of the past that you can't forget God has forgotten them. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake. 
and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, verse 25. The sin in our lives is washed away and forgiven, and it's not our hands or feet that get cut off because of sin. It is Christ's hands and feet that were pierced for our transgressions, and it is by his shed blood and sacrificial death that we are made whole and made clean. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Jesus made the sacrifice in your place so that now you will not suffer eternal damnation. It is finished, he declared on the cross, declaring his mission of salvation completed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the good news is that Jesus took that millstone upon himself and died on the cross with the weight of all our sins upon him so that we are rescued from eternity in hell. And God's promise to each one of us who believes in Jesus Christ is unconditional love and forgiveness for all of eternity. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving Lord of mercy, I come to you just as I am. No pretense, no trying to hide all the bad stuff. You know all the bad things I have ever thought or said or done. This is not how I want to be. The weight of my sin is like a millstone around my neck, and I am sinking, God. I am sinking. I cannot save myself. I need you to save me, please. Thank you, Jesus, for suffering and dying to take the punishment for my sin so that I do not have to. I want to accept your free gift of salvation so that I can be right with you and live for you both now and in eternity. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.